Kia ora koutou. Um, we can see uh, participants coming into the Zoom. Uh, so we're just going to wait a, a few minutes until we see a bit of a plateau of um, attendees joining. No mai hara mai, uh, and thank you for, for, uh, for joining us. So we'll just wait a, a couple more moments. Oh, well, tēnā no tātou, uh, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, no mai hara mai ki tēnei uh, Spotlight Series webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you join us today. Um, we are uh, talking about Mātauranga Māori uh, in the, the talk title Mātauranga Māori Here to Stay was um, Spencer's suggestion actually. Um, and uh, I'm really keen to uh, to sort of talk about Mātauranga Māori from this, um, this particular angle. Uh, let me introduce myself and Spencer more formally, Ko Ocean Mercia Tō Kuingua, Nō Ngāti Pirau. I'm an Associate Professor at Te Kawa Māori, uh, the School of Māori Studies here at Te Heringawaka, Victoria University of Wellington. And I'm the host for today's session. Um, joining me is uh, Associate Professor Spencer Lilly, uh, who's uh, at the School of Information Management, uh, and he comes to academia from a long um, career in, uh, in working in libraries and information management, and was a former president, or is a former president of the Library and Information Association of New, Ze of New Zealand Aotearoa. Uh, we first met uh, when you were working at Massey University, and um, so it's a real Pleasure to, to share the uh, to share the uh, the tupu today and to, on this awesome kaupapa. Uh, so we'll be talking about Mātauranga today from our different disciplines and experiences with Mātauranga. Uh, we'll talk. We'll each go um, do a presentation and we'll speak for about fifteen minutes each or so. We may have questions for each other um, that naturally flow from each other's presentations because uh, I haven't seen your talk yet and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, there will be an opportunity for folks on the webinar to ask questions at the end. Today we're using the Q&A function, so if you have a question, uh, please type that into the, the Q&A uh, section in the Q&A box. And if you like somebody else's question and you want us to, to engage with that, you can upvote it. Um, and we'll aim to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the session, um, and we'll keep an eye on the time and make sure we, we leave time for that. Um, so without further ado, I'll, um, I'll kick off our session today with, uh, with my presentation. And um, so um, Here to Stay was a, pro a TV program in 2007. Maybe that's where you got the idea from, <laughs> um, on recent immigrants in um, Aotearoa, New Zealand, and their, uh, I guess, experiences of um, settling in, in Aotearoa. Um, I guess another uh, alternative for this talk could have been Mātauranga Māori, nowhere else to go, um, because of course there's, uh, there is uh, nowhere for Mātauranga, no other home for Mātauranga Māori except Aotearoa in New Zealand, uh, with a Pacific, strong Pacific basis um, in the history of the development of Mātauranga. It is very much unique and of this place. Um, when I was Googling here to stay, Kat also came up with an idiom of something new, like blogging, something that has stopped being unusual. It's kind of become normalized. And if I think about Mātauranga Māori, it, um, uh, while it once upon a time was a, a Māori, a normal, a normalized um, system of, of knowledge, um, production, and uh, on the way of knowing, uh, that's not the case today. It has sort of been uh, pushed out to the margins but we want to uh, invite um, thought on, on how we can secure Mātauranga Māori, make it, uh, make the, uh, our current um, social political situation such that, um, that this is a place where Mātauranga can thrive. So uh, I'll this one here. Uh, sorry for the wordy uh, slide here, but uh, this is uh, a, a bit of a go-to slide for me when I talk about Mātauranga to different audiences. Um, and uh, 
the dictionary uh, definition talks about it as being Māori knowledge, uh, but it doesn't stop there. It's wisdom, understanding, skill, uh, education uh, has a uh, more common use for Mātauranga. Uh, one of the more historic uses for Mātauranga was a, a sage and a scholar and intellectual, so a person could be a Mātauranga. Uh, Tahiri ni Moko Maid, it's a founding professor of the Kawa Māori Māori Studies, talks about Mātauranga as a philosophy. And more recently, people talk about methods and kaupapa Māori as sort of lining up and intertwining with Mātauranga. So we are feeling our way around the development of, of Mātauranga as well as acknowledging the history of it. Uh, and that history is one you know, of several hundred years of, um, of occupation of the, uh, the Polynesian settlers and uh, their adaptation and um, uh, innovations in relation to this place and, uh, uh, and coming to know it and know, um, know the world and to be in this particular world. Um, and I, uh, yeah, so it's, it's also, uh, while there are some general, uh, generalizable um, aspects of mātauranga, um, it's also an iwi and hapu, a specific um, knowledge system. Uh, very much based in local places and generated in, from um, and speaking to local places. Values-based, relational, uh, very important uh, that connections to mātauranga uh, are of those hapu and iwi and people are, uh, are maintained and it has its own mana and modi. I like this uh, quote of Ta Hirini Mokomid, mātauranga Māori is not like an archive of information or not just a data source. And as someone with a background of science, I, I am interested in mātauranga and it's um, what it has to, to share with us about our histories um, as a source of information. But it's not just that, Mead says, a tool for thinking, organising information and systematising it, considering the ethics of knowledge, the appropriateness of it all, and informing us about our world and our place in it. And uh, also, um, Mātauranga is a taonga, so as a taonga, it's subject to kaitiakitanga responsibility. So as kaitiaki, we have a responsibility to make sure that Mātauranga survives and thrives. Um, this uh, diagram here uh, is from a, a, a journal article that I co-wrote with a couple of students who were in my Māori science class um, 10 or 11 years ago now. And uh, we were doing a bit of a, an exercise around the uh, information, the, the data information um, knowledge wisdom pyramid. And seeing whether that uh, frame uh, was, was something that, that could tell us something more about um, Mātauranga Māori could tell us something uh, interesting about the construction of knowledges and on the Western side of things. And uh, this was um, uh, a bit of a think piece that Anaru Toya did in relation to a particular whakatauki that he'd chosen out of, and this was published in uh, uh, the Hirini Moko Mead and Neil Grove, um, Ngā Pepeha. E kore a parawhenua e haere ki te kore a rakahore. So there's a couple of characters in, in this whakatauki, uh, parawhenua and rakahore, uh, parawhenua being the atua personification of water, and rakahore, the atua personification of, of rock, or one, one of those manifestations anyway. Um, and um, with, with every, uh, I guess, piece of Māori wisdom, there's, there's wisdom, there's, there's knowledge information and a layer and uh, unpack that some more, there's, uh, there's data. Um, so it's a multi-layered, um, much mātauranga is, is very multi-layered. And um, there's some great, as a physicist, there's some great hydrodynamics and um, geology and hydrogeology going on in this whakatauki as well. Without a rock base, water will not flow. Um, so at face value, this whakatauki appears to be about the characteristics of atua but reveals information and data about the natural world embedded within it. Uh, so some years later, 
Um, and, and that was sort of a, an interesting connection that I found just a few months ago that we'd been talking about um, whakatauki and mātauranga of groundwater well before this project um, got set up by GNS Science, led by Dr Catherine Moore and funded by the Ministry for Business and Innovation and Employment through the Endeavour Fund. Uh, te whakaheke o te wai, the, uh, the pathways and flows of the water, literally the, the descents, the sort of gravity embedded in that word as well, um, o te wai. And in this project, we've got sort of a three-pronged um, approach to better understanding uh, groundwater systems, aquifers and uh, recharge, as well as um, uh, discharge of, of waters uh, from groundwater uh, systems into streams and springs. And uh, so we've, we've got uh, new measurements being made in different systems, such as isotopic aging data by um, Dr. Uwe Morgenstern. Uh, we have numerical models that are, are spatial as well as temporal models of what's happening in the underground that are pinned by um, what data we have uh, that enable um, a constraining and honing of, of uh, the accuracy of those numerical models. And mātauranga is a key part of this picture, deepening the, the data timescale of our observations, um, as well as being a kind of a, a nesting place for the work that we're doing on this project. And uh, the, the lion's share of the work is being led by Dr. Amber Aranui, who's um, research um, associate on Te Whakaheke o Te Wai. So um, in her mahi, as a Ngāti Kahunu person, she's um, looking at uh, mātauranga, oral histories um, recorded in, um, and um, more recent oral histories related to freshwater, both above and underground, focusing on um, a place near where she was brought up, Pakipaki, uh, the Paditua stream at Bridge Pa, which, um, uh, which has gone dry in recent seasons. So uh, we've got some master students as well. Three new master students have joined us this year doing uh, individual projects with uh, different iwi and hapu. And um, some of the questions that are arising from this project are, and these questions are, are relevant for um, a number of other projects that, uh, that I'm, I happen to be doing at the moment. Uh, how do we maintain the integrity of Mātauranga Māori as a whole knowledge system when we bring it into conversation, into interaction and collaboration with, uh, with the sciences? Um, how do we achieve epistemic equity? How do we, uh, in practical terms, when we're you know, sitting in front of our computers and, and we're bringing um, uh, Mātauranga and all of the, the sort of iterations of mātauranga um, away from its original source into, into a lab, um, how do we, is it possible to achieve a kind of um, equitable um, knowledge positions? Oops, I'll go backwards. Um, uh, and how does mātauranga Māori remain connected to its holders, to its original owners, to hapū, to Māori, tangata whenua, and not just sort of be kind of separated out or the, the so-called data part of it separated out as a data source for, uh, for incorporation or folding in or mining um, uh, by Western science. So these are tricky questions that we are confronting on just about a daily basis with all the, the different um, uh, aspects of the, the project. But uh, one of the key things that the, the le leader of this project, um, KF Moore, uh, talks about is, is that we want to, with this project, in a sense, use science as um, hands for uh, supporting community concerns. So she talks about giving a numerical voice to community concerns, and particularly in this case around way, around its scarcity um, and around its, uh, its quality or declining quality. Um, I was asked recently by um, a crowd called Monga Bay, what are my hopes for the trajectory of mātauranga um, in Aotearoa into the future? And um, uh, yeah, I, I think it, it does need more support to flourish. We're just sort of kind of holding on to what we have. Um, and uh, yep, so more support is needed and it needs to be supported on its own terms. Um, yeah, uh, 
if what looks best for Mātauranga is not business as usual, uh, which I doubt that business as usual is fit for the future for Mātauranga, then we need to be open to some pretty, pretty radical changes around how we're currently dealing with Mātauranga um, and how we might do that better in the future. Um, and not to instrumentalise Mātauranga as something that could uh, help save our environment, but, but there are you know, practical ways that Mātauranga can and science can support each other to uh, do better by our environments and better understanding um, historic, um, the historic states of environments uh, through to uh, couching our current um, ways of knowing and ways of looking at our um, uh, environments in um, in Mātauranga, and there's some really amazing moves which we might get a chance to talk about later. I think of the New Environment Aotearoa report that is couched in the, the Ngā Whetu Amatariki um, framework. So, um, yeah, there's some, there's some cool stuff on the horizon. So, toi tu te Mātauranga. I'll finish on this, um, this point. I do have a... Um, being a good academic, a list of references on another slide, but I won't, I won't, I'll spare you that. Um, yeah, toi tu te mātauranga, toi tu te whenua. Uh, this is what we strive and aim for. And um, um, yeah, and there are loads of challenges in that, but, uh, but now the different work that we're doing, I think we're finding um, practical ways that we can uh, maintain those connections uh, with mātauranga through practical um, interaction with and use of it and um, yeah you know I look forward to Q&A um, but um, at this stage I guess I'll pass over to you Spence and I don't know if you've got any questions or um, should we just flow straight into your cord or um, I, I think um, we'll just flow straight in and then Kapai. possibly we can have a good chance to get into questions at that point so um, Ka nui te mihi ki a koutou e, e ngā tangata, e hui hui tātou, e te ahi ahi nei, a tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, ka mihi oki, um, ki ocean, uh, ki otta. Um, ka nui te mihi, ki a te kōrero e, e tēnā tā, um, tēnā tātou katoa. Mm. Uh, ko Spencer Lilly, ka ko ingo, uh, Ko Tanaki Toku Mauno, uh, Ko Toku Maru Toku Waka, Ko Waitara Toku Awa, Ko Oki Rangi Oda, Me Nati Tefiti Oku Hapu, Ko Tiati Awa Toku Iwi, uh, Tena Tata Katoa. Uh, as Ocean referred in her opening comments, um, before academia, um, I was in um, library and information positions for, for a number of years. I, I think uh, I counted it was probably something like 25 years of um, professional library experience before becoming an academic. Um, and over that time, um, I uh, was involved in a number of different positions. Um, and with my last position being um, the Māori Services Manager for the Messi University Library System. So um, over the time that I was in the profession, I sort of um, was very conscious of the range of different resources that we had in our library systems and archives um, that contained Mātauranga Māori or focused on Mātauranga Māori in other ways. Um, our, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, when Ocean and I were discussing this uh, lecture um, a few weeks ago, we started out, um, I'd sort of been struck the, a couple of days previously by the auction of this particular Goldie painting. Um, that, uh, the Fano of this Kalmatua were upset that they had not had sufficient time to raise the funds to be able to purchase this item themselves. And uh, they were concerned that this Tonga 
would be lost to their family forever. And um, I guess I could sort of relate to that because um, the fact that it was going into a private collection meant that um, they may not be able to engage with that. It is a taonga, but it's also a form of um, Mataranga Māori, um, although it was painted by Goldie, who was not Māori himself, um, the representation of this komata um, was uh, in its own way a story that could be linked to many different events um, of this komata's life and um, his predecessors, um, his ancestors, as well as those that have descended um, from him. Um, he was well known as uh, one of um, a group of chiefs that went to England in the early 1860s and met with Queen Victoria. But there are many other um, stories and um, important information and knowledge that is associated with him and um, his uh, whanau, hapu and iwi. And I guess this is one of the things that we see within um, the collections that we have in our institutions, that on the um, sort of basis uh, that what you see is what you get to most people. They don't really understand what has gone into the um, development of these resources, um, the personal, the um, the, so the, the collective and um, the, the narratives that belong to these particular taonga that represent Mātauranga Māori in different ways. So um, I thought that, you know, given the whānau's personal um, relationship with this particular taonga um, and the Mātauranga Māori that um, is associated with it, that I would talk about some items that I have found uh, represented in our institutions that have a personal uh, relationship, I have a personal relationship with, um, and they represent um, not only taonga, but um, aspects of Māori and Māori from our perspectives. And it's just representative of the, the types of um, Māori and Māori that we can find in our institutions. This, uh, uh, sorry, the, I think the photo might be a little bit blurred, is um, the anchor stone for Tokumaru Waka, um, and which is, uh, in um, the Pukeareki uh, Museum and Library um, in New Plymouth. Um, it was uh, removed from its resting place uh, in Mohaka Tino, which is on the, um, for those that know um, the Taranaki region is northern part of Taranaki heading towards um, the Waikato um, Tainui um, Basin. So this is the anchor from Tokumaru, and it, as you heard from my pipiha, um, Tokumaru is my waka. Um, so this anchor stone rested um, at Mohoka Tino um, until the 19, early um, 20th century. It was removed, um, put into safekeeping, and then um, was uh, later donated to the Taranaki Museum for safekeeping. Uh, in an article in the Journal of the Polynesian Society, um, Stevenson Percy Smith uh, wrote this particular article about um, the anchor stone, and it was based on uh, information that one of the surveyors had provided to him about the stone before it had gone missing. At this point, they didn't know where it was. So they, they thought that they'd better record the information that they had about it on the observation of um, Skinner. So um, as you can see, it was, it's quite a big stone. Um, and uh, 
they believed that it weighed 336 pounds. I haven't converted that into um, sort of uh, kilograms, but I believe be quite a sizable, um, bigger than the prop forward in, anyway um, for the All Blacks. <laughs> uh, so the sketch is what they had of it at that point. They didn't have, have the photo that um, was in the previous slide, but um, they obviously put it up against this tree so that you could sort of compare it to a tree trunk. Now, 1927, it magically reappeared. And it was at this point that um, it was transferred um, to the Taranaki Museum. Uh, what's also interesting from this photo is um, the, the people that were present, they handed over. The um, person in the front row um, clutching the ads is um, McClutchy and the ads that he is um, grasping is supposed to be the ads that helped carve the Tokamaru um, waka um, that was, had also been protected. Um, to me, the personal connection comes with people that are in the back row. Um, the first gentleman on the left is my great grandfather. Um, woman standing next to him is my great grandmother. The little girl um, being held um, is my aunt, who was the oldest daughter of my um, grandmother, who is the woman that's holding her. Now, um, my family, um, again, and my people, Hippy Hardy you would have heard that I um, um, have affiliations to Pukirangi Order and Nati Tafiti Hapu, um, both uh, which are strong Hapu of the um, Te Akiawa Iwi. Uh, the gentleman's name is Te Mōriri Te Whatateri, and um, his wife next to him is Moari Tahori, the young girl is Gertrude Broughton, which she chose to um, be known as Josie for all her life. She didn't want to be a Gertrude. Um, and my nana is um, Taruhi Moleri Fatateri, um, also um, known as Lucy Broughton. Now, um, to Moleri Fatateri, um, is a name that is also associated with um, Pukirangi Oda. Now, Pukirangi Oda um, is a pass site that is up um, the Waikara Road. Um, it is um, more well known as a um, battlefield during the um, musket wars, uh, so, sorry, during the land wars. But for our hapu, it was a particularly um, important stronghold during um, the musket wars and the, the years before that. Um, in 1821, um, people at Pukirangi Oda helped protect Waikato Tainui Iwi um, from um, being slaughtered by other hapu of Te Atiawa. And then 10 years later, um, Waikato Tainui came down and besieged Pukirangi Oda Pa on the other side, trying to, um, to which all the Te Atiawa hapu had um, sort of come back to, um, to to protect themselves against the invading um, Waikato um, tribes. So um, it's an important part for that reason um, that when the siege was over, about 1,200 sort of, of um, the Te Atiawe, um, people that were in the path jumped off the cliffs into that river rather than be captured 
by Waikato. And a lot of them then migrated down to um, the Kapiti area um, and some further on down into the, the South Island. So it has a, the stories that are associated with that pa um, are very important from the perspective of the whole Taranaki history um, between the collective of iwi in that particular uh, region, plus the relationships with other iwi in hapu, um, both in Waikato, Tainui, but also with uh, Ngāti Toa, Ngāti uh, Rokawa, and then with um, the other um, Te Ati Awa, um, groups that were at the tip of the South Island, and the other groups that are there within like Rangatane, et cetera. So what I'm trying to sort of really get across is that people see a picture, but behind every picture, it, there is knowledge that, that is created with it. Now, the connection that I had with this particular place is that Moriri Fototiri was one of the paramount chiefs of that particular place um, and was um, slaughtered um, during that second siege in 1831-32. But there were descendants from him and my great grandfather that was in that previous photo um, would have been the grandson of that particular chief. So it's, it's showing those connections over time. Mm. The other um, connection that I have is um, with a volcanic rock, which is um, quite prominent down in the New Plymouth Port region, um, known as Paratutu. Now, this rock was um, sort of the oldest form of volcanic um, sort of activity um, in that Taranaki uh, region base. But, to most people, it's, it's just a rock to climb. Um, but to Ngāti Te Whiti, that I'm also affiliated to, it was a, um, it was a place that um, helped um, provide uh, resources. Um, it was a place of refuge. Um, it was also a place where you got a view so um, that you could understand who was approaching and who wasn't. Um, off, the, um, off the coast of Paratutu, you um, also have what um, James Cook called the Sugarloaf Islands, which again had that relation, were part of that volcanic formation, but were also places um, where seals and other marine life um, appeared. And so there's there's that whole history around there about how Ngāti Te Whiti have um, occupied that particular place um, for hundreds of years, and it's gone on to, to sustain um, our hapū. Now, Pokeariki, um, you'll you will heard me mentioned earlier that um, Hokeariki, the library and information um, and museum in New Plymouth, um, is named after Pokeariki, which was the um, hill that um, existed in that particular place until it was um, sort of deconstructed in the 19th century by the early settlers. Um, you, in this particular photo, which is taken from Marsland Hill, which was um, another prominent um, outlook in place in New Plymouth, you can see that Pukeariki um, is that hill in the um, distance from um, there. Now, Pukeariki, of course, means hill of chiefs, and that was um, pretty much the paramount pa site in New Plymouth at that time and it had been formed by um, Ngāti Te Whiti, uh, which wasn't named after Te Whiti o, o Rongamai, the, the prophet, but actually by his great-great-grandfather. Um, so people 
need to understand the, the relationships between different generations of Tafiti or or Runamai. I think he was the third. Um, the the prophet was, you know, um, very much, you know, the third in line of, of the Tafitis that um, are named. So really the place that we know um, and that our hapu have a very, very strong relationship to now is appropriately a library and a museum, which also holds a lot of our mātauranga and our taonga. And when you look at that, those taonga, you can see not only what they were used for, but the thought and the, um, the uh, sort of craft, craftsmanship, um, if I can use that particular term, um, and um, also, you know, sort of the intellect and being able to develop these items that help people to adapt to an environment and use it to the um, most um, helpful extent. Um, sorry, last. Um, one thing I, I would say, you know, our, our institutions are filled with Mātauranga Māori materials um, and they, they are there, but not always being used or understood to their full potential. Um, we have seen huge changes in technology over the last 30 years, particularly. And that has really made a lot more of this material accessible. But in saying that, when searching for this, um, these items, they're not always that discoverable. And in, in some ways that um, means that people are not having the opportunity to engage with items that they may wish to access. But it's also meaning that the, the manner of that material and, and the history and the narratives behind it aren't being realized either. Um, so what we need to see with that digitization and um, the cataloging and making accessible through resources like the internet is a better form of intellectual access. And, this, in a way, is where libraries are, are leading um, through the use of um, na upuku, puku puku, the Māori subject headings, which, um, as you can see, are hosted on the National Library's um, website. Um, just as an example of um, some of the headings that are currently being used. These are, these are the new and changed terms. And this comes back to Mata Ranga Māori, here to stay, because what it's showing is that Mata Ranga Māori is not a static um, knowledge system. It is a knowledge system that is developing all the time. So you will see here that new terms have been applied that are, are relative to the current sort of pandemic issues that we've been working through. And um, as you can see, they, they are sort of being given um, terms that will sort of have meaning um, ongoing and um, are sort of not relying on the scientific or the um, English terms that are being used. So um, I think I'll leave it there because I've, I've probably talked much longer than I should do, and perhaps we can get to some questions. Yeah, Spencer, that was really fascinating. And um, what you've landed on here on the Nga Nupoko Tsukutsuku page is, um, I'm going to have a, 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 a nohi at that. That looks really amazing. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A at this stage. Um, so maybe I can kick us off with a, a bit of a, a question for us both to um, to mull over, and in fact, it's a question that uh, that you suggested um, we should dive into together. Was um, what will Mātauranga Māori look like in the future, given how its transmission 
and access to it has changed already so much in our lifetime. And maybe I'll invite you to have a crack at that one first. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah, you might be. <laughs> I, I, I think that was Laurel and Hardy also. Um, it, it really, you know, looking back, it, it is very hard to predict the future. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the way that uh, technology is evolving um, and how savvy um, Māori are becoming in using that technology, uh, it's, it is very hard to understand how that will um, manifest itself in, you know, in the next 50 years or so. Looking at what has happened over my own lifetime, um, you know, it's hard to pick what is the most fantastic thing that's happened over that lifetime because um, there's so much to choose from and so it's very hard to know. Um, you know, for instance, there's a lot of work being done around artificial intelligence at the moment and what is that going to mean for Maharanga Māori? Um, uh, and, you know, it, it opens up so many possibilities. Um, you know, particularly around how information and knowledge is stored and disseminated, but also sort of um, providing greater opportunities for um, knowledge to be formatted in a way that it becomes um, valuable and accessible to the people that perhaps have the greatest right to it and that they can restrict how it's um, shared with others. And it's going to, back to some of those earlier principles about, you know, sort of um, the protection of knowledge. Um, so, yeah. Mm. And there's a lot going on in that space and the protection of knowledge. And I think of the mana raraunga, um crowd who are exploring Māori data sovereignty principles. Um, and I, I'm just wondering, Spencer, if there's any, um, the, uh, the fair slash care data principles for um, the care principles being about Indigenous data protection, particularly in, as in, data is increasingly becoming more available to us through the digital realm. Um, is that uh, something that um, in your field you're seeing uh, practical solutions being wrapped around and making sure that you know provenance is known and um, and that some materials are could be considered sort of limited in terms of their access is I, I, I think there's a greater awareness of it mm. um, I think there's still a lot to be done in terms of trying to sort of develop systems that enable um, both access and restriction. Um, and I guess that you know, is something that needs to be worked on. There's obviously a movement, um, particularly in academia, but also in the wider um, information professions towards open access. And um, we have to understand some of the ethical issues around who makes the decision as to what should be open to everyone and what shouldn't be. And I think, you know, sort of, um, obviously some people that become very, very enthusiastic about open access have to think that there are people from with, that have different value systems may not sort of buy into the um, openness in, in quite the same way. And I think there's still a lot of conversations to be held around that. Mm, yeah. Um, we've got some uh, questions coming through the Q&A. So uh, let's, shall we turn to some of those? Mm. Um, so is this the first one that's come through there, Helen, uh, from Sally? Um, uh, as a geophysicist, can you talk more about the incorporation of Mātauranga Māori into your work? Um, so my, my training in physics, a little bit of geophysics, um, 
uh, is goes back, you know, sort of 20 years now. So over the last 18 years or so, I've um, I've been in the, uh, the School of Māori Studies. So um, I guess one of the things that that motivates a lot of my work. Um, so not to speak about anything in particular, uh, because. I tend to be the um, sort of the uh, proposal writer and, um, um, <laughs> and paperwork person, and the students get to do all the fun stuff. Um, and there's a there's a tension there for me. So I asked Amber, for instance, if it was okay to share her photo and just a word about her work, um, as I showed you before, and she said that was fine. So, but I do feel that that work, in a sense, it's coming from their hands, so it's their right to share it. So. Um, so there are, uh, I guess, tensions around the ownership of the work and the research that I do in this space, um, just in that, that particular um, frame of, um, you know, student and supervisor. Um, so, yeah, but, uh, but one of the motivations for, for my work is, is um, seeking a kind of a, a reconciliation between what I can see is, is to... Um, uh, amazing uh, knowledge systems, uh, and uh, and I think there's some really amazing physics within Mātauranga Māori that um, is sort of some, something that I'd like to do more of. Um, but uh, Amber and Kath are really the people who are working uh, at the, the sort of uh, coalface, if we want to use that term, these things we're talking geophysics, um, and finding ways to... Um, to, to set uh, three, three systems of knowing a kind of an empirical measurement system, a modeling system, which is, is forecasting and hindcasting, um, and uh, a mātauranga Māori system and exploring how they can work together and can support each other for better, more precise um, understandings of what's happening um, in our groundwater systems historically and into the future. Uh, and we're working on a similar kind of in a similar way um, in the Moana project, which is uh, looking at um, oceanography um, and Māori as oceanographers and uh, doing work in um, forecasting marine heat waves. So um, uh, that's sort of a, just an overview really of the work as opposed to drilling down into any specifics. Um, We've got a question there that looks like it's for Spence. Oh, yeah. Um, so, a uh, question from Nicola Short. Um, what are your views about the impact of Taonga being taken from their whenua, e.g. being put into museums um, on the Mātauranga for the place Fano in Hapua and the Taonga? Um, I think yeah, there's a number of questions there around who has the right to take material and put it into museums. A lot of the items that end up in that situation have been discovered um, and have been donated to museums by um, individuals typically that would not be seen as the traditional owners of those items. Um, I think possibly that it's good that they have put them forward to them um, to the institutions um, rather than hold on to them or destroy them. Um, but I think the question that really comes into it then is uh, what is the responsibility of the institution to that material and who are they accountable to for, for these items? Um, and sort of the relationships between them and the rightful owners, the mana whenua, or the um, people that um, these items belong to traditionally, and who should have the say over how they are cared for in the future, whether they should be repatriated, whether they, whether they should be digitised. Yeah, so these are a lot of questions around there, and it really comes back to those sort of um, being able to distinguish between um, the donors and the owners. <laughs> um, and, you know, sort of, and they're not the same group of people um, always. So I think, you know, there, there are um, a lot of questions and it's possible that, you know, sort of um, in the 
there have been a number of um, hapu and iwi that have set up their own um, repositories or um, sort of uh, cultural knowledge centers that may see that as being where these items should end up going back to. And then I think, you know, those discussions need to be held. Um, you know, people say that you can do digital repatriation, but why should it be the, the, the rightful owners that get the digital version and not the original version? Um, museums and libraries, et cetera, can take a digital copy for their purposes, but basically, but, you know, they could send um, the original item back to um, the owners. I, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's... I think you, you're, you're answering Tracy Maniapoto's question there too. I think with that um, Whakautsu uh, Spencer, should Taonga and Mātauranga Māori be held within cultural heritage institutions? Um, and I guess just uh, thinking about our people who are working within cultural heritage institutions, they've um, uh, in a sense uh, strike me as being kind of a surrogate kaitiaki, they may not be connected iwi or hapu wise to the, directly to the taonga, but they're there. And I just want to acknowledge the mahi that they do, uh, especially in the repatriation side of things. And Amber Aranui, who I've mentioned before, has been deeply involved in uh, repatriation of human remains. Um, uh, which one should we go to next? Um, I see there's a few. Question from Jean Fleming about uh, how Pākehā can incorporate Mātauranga more into the research. Should this be only through Māori? I believe that Māori have to be strongly involved in that research. Um, not only as the um, people being researched, but as part of the research um, team that is um, undertaking that research. And so, um, in, in a sense, you know, working in partnership with those that are not Māori in the research team to um, be ensuring that the research that they're doing is within the spirits of the Kaupapa Māori um, research and um, ensure that it's been done for the right reasons and um, the benefits are going to accrue through to those that are being researched. Mm. So I think it's really an alliance thing if, if Pākehā or um, non-Māori are going to be involved. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned the term alliance and the um, there's a, a huge role for Pākehā allies in decolonising spaces so they are more fit, more welcoming for Mātauranga Māori, for Māori people in general. Um, and there may be places where um, that allyship can, um, can reach into uh, questions of, of um, Māori knowledge and Māori histories. Um, but yeah, Māori have to be the ones making the calls, the decisions and guiding that mahi and um, and, and also need to be resourced to do that. Um, so um, this is a this is a mahi for all of us to work together on. Um, but um, uh, it, things will fit into place better if <laughs> if it's uh, if it's Maori leading these corridors. Yeah. Um, so Sally's got a question up there, which maybe we'll be able to combine with. Um, because uh, it sort of flows on for the, from the geophysics question with something further down. Uh, but Will Black asks, how do you see aligning data sovereignty to tetiriti to combat genomic discrimination and preserve data as a taonga? Um, how does that fit in with um, mātauranga Māori? Um, so genomic discrimination, I, I guess I understand that um, uh, by the potential of, I guess, genomics to um, to to be captured and to be used in ways that are not ethical, that are not uh, 
uh, set and designed by communities for good goods of communities, but um, have capitalist goals in mind and, and um, profit making is their kind of core uh, thing. Um, so uh, they, the, I think these are absolutely part of the same conversation, which is about tenoranga tiratanga, is about um, ultimate sovereignty over, um, over our bodies, over ourselves, over our mātauranga, our data, data about us that's been collected on us, and that's the, the mahi of te mana raraunga. Um, and um, so, yeah, uh, yeah, so I, I see those things all lining up and um, being kind of answered by those core principles of mana motuhake and, and tino rangatiratanga. Um, so what we need is, is ways, um, systems, practices, uh, institutions that can support um, Māori sovereignty over, over all of those things, including kind of body and genetic sovereignty. Kia ora for that, that question. Um, kia basabas, uh, Mātauranga Māori iwi and hapu specific. Um, in teaching or incorporating Mātauranga Māori into te ao Pākehā, how can we learn about Mātauranga Māori in a way that is less homogenised and captures more iwi hapu specific thought? Mm, that's a great question. I think um, um, an entry point might be a kind of a decolonizing one. So you kind of clear the space mm. um, uh, for uh, a right engagement with, um, with Mātauranga Māori. Mātauranga a iwi, Mātauranga a hapu um, uh, will, will follow through connections with people, through supporting relationships with, um, with, with people um, and the, their relationships with their mātauranga. So, um, so there'll be cases where you might uh, kind of go down one avenue or another, depending on, on um, what, what your particular um, mahi is. Um, yeah, uh, there's a sort of, we, we've become a little bit wary of the kind of ring a kaumatua um, and bring a kaumatua into the school kind of um, mode because our kaumatua and kuia are just so drawn upon for so much these days and, um, and that's, a, that's a very precious and scarce resource so we do need to be quite careful about how we use those scarce and precious resources. Mm. Um, but but there's definitely uh, I think avenues for both of those those things when we when we're um, when we're teaching it and the curriculum is inviting us to look at our histories or uh, um, not just inviting but um, that's part of curriculum now um, and so that can be part of the sort of decolonization conversation is understanding uh, colonial histories in order to um, to to move into a space that is. Um, uh, able to uh, uh, more fully realise the kind of tiriti aspirations for for our society. Um, I'm conscious of time. We're at one twenty nine, so um, we've got a few questions left. Uh, one for you, Spence, on Tokumaru. Yeah, um, there's the story about that particular um, waka and and stone sort of come back to a narrative about Manaya, who was the um, kaihotu of that particular waka, and the fact that they came down the west coast of the North Island, and they, they tried to put ashore further up the west coast, and um, were sort of rebuffed by um, waka called Tainui, who were already there, so they came a bit further down and sort of um, came um, to there. So there, there is a narrative that is there, but I'm conscious that that narrative has really been shared by people like Percy Smith and others um, from around that time, that perhaps some of that knowledge has been embellished a little bit. So there's probably a lot more work that, and there could be other knowledge that I'm not aware of myself at the moment that um, is there available for people. And it's only really sort of, getting into that situation where you can talk to people about these things that may have this other forms of knowledge to go with this, that you can you can start making sense of it, so. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Rebecca's um, question there is the most upvoted, so maybe we can spend just half a minute mm. on that one. The role of archivists, librarians, curators is to better embed 
Oh, two better in bed, mātauranga ma way we currently work. Any ideas on that one? I think it's really understanding the environment that you're working in and the, the, the value of the um, resources that you are working with and understanding the value of those to the people that they traditionally own uh, uh, owned by but also even you know through the use of photos like i've showed today that you understand that there's more to the photo um what i'm finding myself in terms of accessing these things is that there's not a lot of information about how they're related to particular hapu or iwi and fano that they don't have you know sort of um access points there so i think looking at what we're doing with na upuku uh, tuku and so looking at how we can expand on those to sort of make that matter sort of more uh, evident than it currently is but it's all about sort of raising your consciousness about these issues and mm. learning more and developing those relationships i think is mm. is, is critical Kilda, i think that um the other thing too is te reo Māori is just there's so much just embedded in uh, Māori language materials and, and the reo itself. Um, so uh, folks who have joined us on the, uh, the webinar, ngā mihi nui kia koutou. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your questions and apologies. We couldn't answer all of them in the time that we had. Really appreciate everyone being here today. Um, Toitu te mātauranga, ngā mihi nui kia koutou katoa.